Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. My name is Chris Dodson. I am with the uh, Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center, um, and we are uh, going to be talking uh, over the next hour or less about um, grant and loan writing. Uh, and I'll be offering you some tips on <clears throat> how to uh, how to put together a grant or loan application uh, and things to be thinking about, and then also uh, briefly where to look for some of those funding opportunities, particularly for municipal uh, water infrastructure, uh, planning processes, uh, and other things uh, related to uh, local government uh, uh, external funding. Uh, but before we get into the, the presentation, I wanted to first of all thank uh, Representative uh, Brindisi's office for helping to sponsor this webinar and get it out to many of you. Um, and uh, to and, and joining us today is, is Faith Favra from uh, Representative Brindisi's office. So I'd like to. Uh, Thank her and also introduce her uh, and, and let her um, uh, talk for a little bit. Thanks, Chris. So I just wanted to thank everybody for um, coming in on this webinar. We are excited once again to have um, people sign up and be ready to go. We wanted to let you know why we're doing this and why we're helping to get this information to all of you. And one of the reasons is because when we travel around New York 22 and mostly around the state even, a lot of times we find that local leaders are asking us for information on water infrastructure. And so in partnering with the Environmental Finance Center, I think that we you know, can create this great um, place for people to ask questions and be able to get their questions really answered because I can only take back what I know, um, you know, which, which obviously not an expert on water infrastructure. So this is a great idea to have this happen. And we just appreciate everything that everybody does in their local municipalities too. So back to Chris and we'll get started. Thanks, Faith. Uh, you'll notice in your, um, in your control panel for the GoToWebinar here on your computer, if you're, if you're using your computer and not just calling in by phone, you'll notice uh, there's a tab for questions. So whenever you have a question, uh, you can click into that tab and type it in. Uh, my colleague Tess Clark is sitting right next to me, and she'll be jotting down those questions as they come in. Because there are so many people on the webinar today, we've got you all muted. Um, and so we'll be taking all the questions at the end. So uh, for those of you who didn't join the first presentation uh, about a month ago, uh, we uh, went through uh, a considerable number of state and federal funding programs for municipal uh, projects, infrastructure, planning, parks, uh, all kinds of other things. So that webinar is uh, recorded and available on our website, which is efcnetwork.org. Uh, that was, um, we hosted that again with Brindisi's office on September 18th. Uh, so you can look, if you go to EFCN, net, uh, efcnetwork.org and look for uh, the funding and financing uh, webinar um, oh, under that date. <clears throat> Uh, so anyway, this webinar is meant to be a follow-up to that webinar. So that webinar, we talked about what programs are out there. This webinar, we're going to talk about how to apply for them and things to think about. So you see on this cover page, really, uh, I think the three main things to consider are, is this the right grant? Is this the right funding program? Is it the right time for you uh, to apply? Do you have the capacity? Um, do you have other projects that are irons in the fire? Um, is it the right time for that funding program? Maybe their priorities are shifted towards something else this year. Um, and a good example of that would be uh, the DEC's Water Quality Improvement uh, Program. Uh, the DEC finalized some regulations on salt storage and started to require uh, covered salt storage areas a few years ago. And so that funding program not all of the money, but a lot of the money got reprioritized to fund salt sheds, right? So not 
only is it the right time for you, but is it, is it the right time for the funding program? Uh, and is it the right project? Does the project fit the, the priorities of the funding program? Does the project fit your own priorities? Uh, so, you, many of you probably recognize this guy uh, from the 80s and 90s, Matthew Lesko, with his big book of free money. Um, well, there's really no such thing as free money. Um, anything that you, uh, any money that you get, whether it's a loan or a grant, comes with some sort of strings, whether that is uh, an interest rate on a loan, uh, whether that is uh, requirements for Davis Bacon or American Steel or other kind of uh, contractual requirements that come with a grant. Um, administering a grant program takes a lot of time and bookkeeping, paperwork. Uh, you often have to um, come up with local cost share, match, right, your own money. Maybe they give your project is a million dollars and they'll give you 900,000. You still have to track that difference. Uh, you still have to track that 100,000 that they didn't fund to show them that you're actually contributing 10% of your own money. So there's no such thing as free money. A grant sounds great. Someone's just going to write you a check. That's not how it works. Most of them are reimbursement programs. You have to show that you're spending the money. You have to show that you're on a timeline, that you're using particular processes uh, as far as uh, bidding out contracts and, and things like that. So um, you prob many of you probably already know that, but just as a reminder, you know, grants do take effort and there are obligations that have to be met with that free money. So you have to ask yourself, what's more painful? <laughs> Coming up with some sort of uh, in maybe an internal source of funding, a new rate structure or something else, or writing and administra administering a grant. Um, again, grants and loans are multi-year um, efforts. It might take you the better part of a year to write an application. It'll take the better part of a year to find out whether you were awarded uh, and then to get into contract with that uh, grant program. And then it might take you two or three years to go through the contracting, the, the bidding, uh, the mobilization, demobilization of the project, and then writing all the final reports and reimbursements. So think about you know, which might be less difficult. Um, and then again, you know, is the project a funding priority for you, uh, for the funding source? And most communities in New York have a comprehensive plan or some sort of planning process, some sort of master plan for their community. If you don't, uh, that's a different topic that I could talk about for an hour, but I might suggest you go back and have that comprehensive plan developed so you can figure out, you know, where your community is going in the future. And is this project uh, fitting into the big picture for your community, or is it a distraction in time and other resources? Um, so developing your project idea. Uh, so really coming up with a, a concept. So we need a new wastewater treatment plant. We can't think anything about, you know, th there's no way to be creative about that. And maybe that's true, but you do want to think about um, how you want to sell, essentially, the idea of funding that pro uh, project for your community to the program officer who's going to be reviewing your application. Part of that is um, to really see, you know, what else is out there and who's doing what. Maybe there are new technologies that people are exploring that, let's just say, the state would fund this project. The state is interested in subsidizing. You want to do a new treatment process or uh, or, so, or something that will help you with the regulation. If you're in the southern tier, in much of the uh, District 22, uh, in Chesapeake Bay area, we're under a TMDL, a total maximum daily load, uh, for the Chesapeake Bay, for the Susquehanna River. So sticking with the, the, the example of a wastewater treatment plant, the state might be interested in seeing you reinvest in your wastewater treatment in a way that would remove more nutrients from the water that the co-benefit of that is helping the state meet their TMDL, right? So thinking about, you know, where your project fits in your own big picture, but also the big picture of kind of the geography around the, the geopolitical environment in which we all sit, right? And you can do that in some ways by seeing what else is out there, who they're funding, uh, to do what. 
Then you have a chat session, not dissimilar from the one that we're having right now. You know, if we wanted to spend the next hour talking about how to, you know, get funding for a wastewater treatment plant for Village X, we could do that, right? And we'd start looking at some examples of what's been funded elsewhere. Uh, and we'll do that at the end of this hour, actually. We'll go onto the website and I'll show you how to do some of this research. Then, you know, put your ideas to paper, jot down notes, um, be able to describe, uh, thoroughly describe the proposed project. It's not just a wastewater treatment plant. It's a wastewater treatment plant for why uh, and how are you going to treat water, right? What's the process? What's the technology? What's the size? The million gallons per day, et cetera, et cetera. And part of that is thinking about what your goals and objectives are. Yes, it might be to, you know, meet your consent decree, but it also might be to improve the, the water quality in the tributary to Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it may also mean that you will be able to provide clean drinking water, you know, for a downstream community. Or if you're talking about building a drinking water plant, improve drinking water quality for your, your existing customers. It may also be if you get a grant to do this project, you're saving your rate payers X number of dollars over X number of years. These could all be goals and objectives. They're very important. It means that you've thought through these things. When the reviewer looks at it, they're not just like, oh yeah, the Village of X has a consent decree. They need a new wastewater treatment plant. Let's fund them. That's part of it for sure. But they also want to see that you've thought through all of the co-benefits of the project because they use those same co-benefits to justify to their bosses, to their funders, to our state elected officials who, who create their balances for these funding programs, what they're getting, you know, the bang for the buck, what they're getting out of that money. And it's not just you meeting your consent decree, it's you saving your taxpayers dollars, it's you improving water quality, et cetera, et cetera. So really think about those goals and objectives. They're important for a number of reasons. Establish a realistic timeline. Uh, build in an extra month for every year, at least, that you think this project's going to go on, because things always run behind. Um, estimate costs. And that timeline should also be kind of congruent with what your engineering uh, feasibility study might suggest as well. Again, using wastewater as an example. Uh, estimate costs for your staff, for materials, for equipment. Um, if you're using a consultant, if you're building, you know, water, wastewater infrastructure, even if you're building a park, right, you're going to have a vendor or a consultant or a contractor help you with some of that cost estimation and the timeline. And then what's the evaluation for success? You've built the project on time and you've built it within budget. That could be a good evaluation of success, but looking back at those goals and objectives, are you meeting those goals and objectives? That's also part of a way to evaluate for success. And frankly, that's important to look back at those goals and objectives as an evaluation of success, because if you've met them, then you, your, list of your, your, your list of successes therefore then becomes longer. And frankly, most projects are over budget and over time, right? So uh, if you only evaluate your success on those two metrics, chances are you probably are not going to be successful if you're looking at budget and time. And then once you build it, you know, and again, it could be a park, a wastewater treatment plant, or maybe you're asking for money to develop a plan or a feasibility study. So once you build it, or once you create it, or once you write it, what do you do with it? How long do you need it? What do you, what's the next step? How long do you want it to last? Um, and if it's something like a water or wastewater treatment plant, plan for its future, plan for its operations and maintenance. Those things cost money. And if you are replacing an old treatment plant, you might have a guideline to go by. If you're building a new one, you may not. Um, but even, again, you know, getting away from the wastewater treatment plant example for a minute, developing a plan, you write it. So what? Then what? What are you, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to use that plan to uh, develop additional projects? Or you use that plan to uh, create new zoning or something like that. What are you, what are you going to do with, with the product? Um, and that's something you want to include in your grant application. So other things to think about. Are you eligible for that particular project? 
most, or excuse me, funding program. Most municipalities are um, eligible for most uh, funding programs offered through the state and even to the federal level. Uh, there are some that aren't, you know, through maybe um, the economic development agency, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if you're talking about infrastructure, if you're talking about things that are within your purview as a local elected official, as a municipality, there are a lot of eligible funding programs out there for you. Now, the other thing to think about, many of them offer or require a match. So you bringing your own money to the table. We could talk a little bit in detail about what match is, essentially. You have cash on hand, that could be a match. Again, if you have a million dollar project, they offer 90% funding. The 10% was something you'd have to come up with locally. It could be uh, cash, it could be time. So the clerk is gonna spend five hours a week for the next three years on this project. She makes $20 an hour. So five hours a week, that's $100 a week. That's about uh, $5,000 a, a year, just doing back of envelope math. That could also be counted as match. That's her time, right? How many are funded? So you may be applying for a very um, competitive program. So maybe there's a, a better program for you. Competitive programs you may be applying for um, um, over and over until you make it above that funding threshold. Uh, how much money? What's the range? Maybe you need to build a $4 million treatment plant while applying to a $500,000 capped grant is only one piece of the puzzle. Can you meet the guidelines? Uh, and then what type of project is it? Some of them don't fund hard infrastructure. Some fund planning or other types of projects. And then finally, the geographic spread, right? Um, the state, particularly, and even the feds like to spread their money around. Uh, if the town next to you is proposing the same thing you are at the same time, my money is on the fact that only one of you would get funded that year. So 10 reasons why proposals fail. There's probably more than this, but I think these are ones that are very important. The guidelines aren't followed. Read the instructions. A lot of the, the funding programs, particularly at the state level these days, maybe it's three or four pages of excuse me, of instructions. It's not a lot of information to digest. Uh, you're not reaching the program priorities. Um, again, what is it that they're prioritizing their funding for that year, and do you meet it? It's incomplete or not on time. Uh, I was aware of uh, a funding uh, a, a grant application just a month ago that um, they inadvertently attached the wrong document to their funding application, uh, even though they thought they turned it on time. And so the next day the program officer noted that and they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't review or process the grant because it was incomplete, even though it was on time. So make sure that you really have everything buttoned up and that you're submitting on time, especially if you're doing uh, an electronic submission, because sometimes, you know, People lose their internet, computers freeze, websites time out. You want to give yourself a lot of time to get things together. A poor demonstration of need, um, using the wastewater treatment plant example. Again, maybe you know, you're not under consent order. Uh, your plant isn't really that old and it seems to be functioning well. You just want to increase capacity to increase potential development in your community. Probably not. Uh, a need that the state is prepared to support at, at this time, given the number of failing systems around. around. Um, the other thing to think about is, you know, is the application, does the application appear to be, uh, be, be beyond your capacity? So are you proposing to do a project uh, and you're not building in enough staff time or enough consultant or contractor time to help you do it? Um, you want to show that you're more than just a so-called, you know, one-man show. Uh, your implementation plan looks weak. So again, show them, you know, through, uh, through a timeline, through um, phases of the project, how you intend to get the work done. Um, an unrealistic budget, maybe way too low or way too high. Again, 
this is where consultants and, and, and vendors can come in and help you put together realistic numbers and justify them. Uh, a greater cost than benefit. So, you know, again, maybe the cost to do the project uh, doesn't, the benefit doesn't merit the cost. So maybe you want to put in, uh, you know, a park next to a river or a school or something uh, in your community and you want to put all these bells and whistles on it, um, but maybe the population of your community uh, or the population of the school or, um, or something like that doesn't merit the cost to that project. So maybe you have to ratchet it down a little bit. Four, through your goals and objectives, think of other co-benefits to the project. And then finally, it's poorly written. And this isn't you know, typos and, and, and punctuation as much as it is clarity. Uh, I think often project managers can overlook a typo here and there or a misplaced comma. But if the writing isn't clear, if they don't understand what it is that you're trying to say, then it's not going to get very far. A couple of keys to success. Uh, again, the funding, and just thinking specifically about the state, though the federal government is the same way. Um, if you're getting funding from a state program, that state program's budget is set, set by your elected officials at the state level. They're looking for cool stuff that they can tout, that they can promote. So innovation and creativity are really important. So, and they also often help to solve uh, old problems using new solutions. Uh, and so, again, with wastewater treatment, maybe you're thinking about doing a different type of technology that will remove more nitrogen from your effluent. Uh, that's innovative. That's creative. And it's, it's uh, something that might be um, beneficial to include in your project or in your application. Probably the biggest piece of advice I could give you in this hour of time we'll spend together is making sure that you call the program officer uh, that, that manages that funding program. Uh, their contact information is available. It may not say, you know, Chris Dodson and here's his phone number and his direct email address. It may be, you know, funding program at efc.gov or something like that. But there's someone on the other end of that email who will get a hold of you. Uh, same thing, it may be a 1-800 number, but there's someone on the other end of that phone that will, a uh, number that will either pick up the phone or call you back. Developing that relationship with that person is important. Also getting them to understand what it is you're trying to do so they can tell you what their priorities are and where they are and gee whiz, that's a great idea, but this year our budget was cut and, our, and the number of applications we've had so far have gone up. So. It's going to be difficult, but we love that project and we encourage you to apply, right? That's the kind of information you want to hear from someone face-to-face uh, -face or over the phone. So I really th – and then, again, when, that, when your application comes through, that program officer is like, oh, yeah, right, I knew this was coming. They talked to me. Uh, and that helps them be able to better sell or support your project to their colleagues. So what keeps a lot of people from applying for grants? The fear of rejection is one, right? Um, but the opportunity here is uh, you've written a grant, you've taken the time to write this project, it was rejected. The next thing you do is you call the program officer or you send them an email saying, hey, you know, we heard our project was rejected, but we'd really like to get some feedback. Um, so, you know, why was it rejected? And they may say um, something like, uh, you know, like I just said, the program officer, we've had a lot of applications this year, great project, just didn't make the cut, resubmit next year, and you'll get a pretty good chance, right? And as this third bullet says, the success rate is higher for proposals turned in a second time. Uh, and so being able to do that, uh, Sometimes the feedback is, well, we weren't really sure what you were trying to do, or we didn't really feel good about your budget, or something like that. Um, and that is good feedback, too. So it means go back, revise the budget, make it stronger, make it more clear what your objectives are, resubmit the next year, and you might get, um, you may, might get funded again that second year. 
<clears throat> so the success rate on a third submission is almost one to one. So again, call that program officer, get feedback if you get rejected, and then rewrite, revise, resubmit. So what else keeps us from getting grants? People don't have confidence in their own ability to write. Uh, and so this is a little bit of a, a joke about uh, bad writing. The cool thing is these days with applications, um, it's more like it's it's more like filling out a form than it is writing paragraphs and paragraphs of text. So if you can put together a couple of thoughts in two to three sentences, you could probably uh, apply for a grant. But some things to think about, and some of this might make you feel like you're going back to grade school. Um, you know, the five W's. If you can answer the five W's, right? Who, what, why, when, and also how. Uh, Answering those in your grant application is probably the most important thing you can do. Um, you want to make sure you're clear and concise. You want to write to inform. This is why we want to do this. This project is important to us because. Um, so you're writing to inform. You're also writing to persuade. That said, you don't want to use biased language or hyperbole. Uh, you don't want to say, you know, without this project, we fear for the future of our community. Um, because while that may be true, it's a little bit uh, hyperbole, right? Um, your community is probably not going to just uh, vaporize if you don't get funding for new wastewater treatment plants. It just means you're going to have to wait another year or seek out some other source of funding. You also don't want to use opinion. You want to use data. Um, and the data could be, uh, you know, again, using the park as an example. Uh, there are 500 kids in this elementary school. Uh, we've got a commitment from the school that they'll use this pro, this, this, um, this park. And so X number of kids will spend X number of hours in this park on average each school year. And the benefits to those kids of that outdoor time is X, Y, and Z, right? This information is is out there uh, to include, to establish the credibility of your application and the need for your project, being able to use some external data sources. It's also best not to write in the first person, not I and we, but the town or the village or the district. Uh, write to the funding source. So if you are doing a green infrastructure project, say, um, you know, a rain garden adjacent to a sidewalk with porous asphalt, uh, and you're submitting it to the, um, the ESC for the Green Innovation Grant Program, that's great. That's a good funding source. But keep in mind, they're less interested in walkability. Uh, if you're putting in a sidewalk where there wasn't a sidewalk before, they're less interested in walkability in your neighborhood than they are the stormwater capture that they're getting from that porous pavement and the bioswale adjacent to it. So just make sure that you're writing to their priorities, which are usually very clearly listed uh, in the application or on their website. Also, using words that paint a picture. So uh, rain barrel insulation on school grounds. Okay, well, we know what you want to do, but it's pretty kind of just general. Uh, what about teaching students about stormwater management through experiential hands-on learning. Now that's telling a lot more about your intent for the project. Anybody can put rain, barrel on, rain barrels on school grounds, but, but why? You didn't say why. Uh, and so the second, um, the second sentence not only um, paints a picture, uh, but it gives a little bit more of that why. We did an in-person funding rounds table not that long ago, uh, and I offered some of these slides at the beginning of it, and a couple of the funding program uh, officers from, this, from New York State said, you wouldn't believe how many applications they get for wastewater treatment plants, where the title is wastewater treatment plants. So being able to take some time to create a title, to create words, to paint a picture, and start telling your story for you. So another example, right? Your title is your elevator speech. At a quick glance, what are you trying to do with this funding? So 
local waterfront revitalization in, in the village of Littleville? Well, the funding program is called Local Waterfront Revitalization Program. So why would you refer to the funding program in your own title? This is also something I've heard from the program officers at the state. It surprises them how often uh, people say engineering planning grant as their title for an application to the engineering planning grant funding program. And so you can see the title below, creating a Creekside Live Work Play District in downtown Littleville. That starts telling a, a, a story about what it is you intend to do through this application. It's not only more, um, more informative, but it's a little bit more attractive, really, uh, to the grant reviewer. And keep in mind, these folks are reviewing many, many grants. Anything you can do to stick out in a positive way is good for you. So once you've edited your grants, you've inputted all the boxes and answered all the questions, set it aside for a day or more, have someone else read it. Uh, you want to make sure that that other person, what they see on the paper is what you see on the paper. What's in your head is on that page. And if it's not, then it's probably not going to also be that clear to the funding program representative. And if that's the case, then that means you need to start uh, editing a little bit more, uh, sharing maybe with a broader group of people so that they can get those words on the paper as a shared vision across all of you. If two or three or four or five people read the same dis uh, application description and they all come away with the same project concept or idea, then that's good. And that means your project officer, when they're reviewing it, probably will too. So now let's talk money. Uh, this is referring back to our previous webinar. Uh, this is just a quick overcap. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but here are some of the major funding programs. The first one is federal, uh, USDA Rural Development. If you're a community with a population of $10,000, $10,000, a population of 10,000 or less, uh, you are uh, able to access a number of their programs. Uh, and, and some of them are really cool. So they have the water and the wastewater infrastructure uh, loan program. Uh, they, they actually will co-fund with a number of the state funding programs as well. So again, if you have something like a $4 million wastewater treatment plant that you're trying to fund, and the state comes with, to, one state program comes to you with a million, another state program comes to you with 600,000, maybe rural water can come to you with a num a, a, another pot of money uh, so that they can get you, all of those programs together can get you to a fully funded project. Rural Development also has a community facilities program, which I think is pretty cool. So they'll fund schools and hospitals and helicopters and, and fire departments and town halls and fire trucks and, uh, um, excuse me, community centers and other, and other cool stuff owned by the local uh, municipality or district. Uh, there's also the Community Development Block Grant, which is um, administered through the New York State Department of Housing and Community Renewal. They've got a number of cool programs, funding programs. New York State Department of State. Uh, if you are in, uh, if you're adjacent to um, parts of Lake Ontario, uh, St. Lawrence River, and, and adjacent to Canada, um, uh, through the New York State Department of State, they have the Northern Border Regional Commission. There's money available for those counties or communities in those counties. As well as, I'm not sure why I neglected to include it here, but the Appalachian Regional Commission. This is pretty much the southern tier of New York. <laughs> Excuse me, from Chautauqua um, County uh, over to, I think, uh, Delaware and up to um, Schoharie and, and Otsego and Cortland. Uh, it's also run by the Department of State. And a lot of that money is actually, um, I think, maybe allocated through the regional planning and development boards along the southern tier. Uh, to work with communities in those counties. Uh, we have NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Um, the DEC has a number of funding programs, Ag and Markets, and then the New York State Environmental Facilities Program. This is where the um, revol State Revolving Loan Fund is for water and wastewater projects. 
also the Green Innovation Grant Program. They do the Engineering Planning Grant too. So this could be, you know, uh, an, uh, you you're not sure if you need a, waste, a new wastewater treatment plant or an upgrade, but you think you should probably study it. Well, you can do the Engineering Planning Grant. You can get money to look at whether or not you need improvements to your plant or whether or not you need a new plant. And so that's kind of cool to get that money to help you figure out what it is that you need so that you can develop the right project and then go back to the EFC a year or two later uh, and access money uh, to fund that project. So again, these are some uh, popular funding programs. Um, a lot of the state funding programs uh, are within the uh, consolidated funding application. The consolidated funding application is tied to the New York State uh, Regional Economic Development Council program. And so you see the state is divided up into, uh, I think, 10 different regions here uh, by county. So you can identify what county you're in and then you know what region you're in. And that's important. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so, a couple things to know about the Regional Economic Development Councils. So, looking at this map again, right, each of these regions has developed a report, has developed a vision for, for their region. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so, what are their main initiatives? What are the critical issues that, that they have identified for their region? Uh, what are the challenges that they'd like to address? Uh, or that they, they've identified, and how do they want to address them? And what are their strategies and goals to improve the economy? These are important things to know because you want to be able to, so you're, you're, if you're applying to the state for the consolidated funding application, you're essentially uh, selling your project in two stages, one to your regional economic development council and the other to the state program. And the, re the reason you want to be able to articulate your project to the region is because they fund 20 points out of 100 points of your application. So before your application even gets to the state for review and scoring, it goes to the Regional Economic Development Council first, and they, they, they also rate it and score it. So the difference, as you will remember from high school, the difference between 100 and 80 is big, right? And so you want to make sure you're having those conversations with your local representatives of your regional economic development council that you're at least aware of, if not being able to connect your project to some of their main initiatives and critical issues and challenges and strategies and goals and such. And so you want to have the support of your RADC as soon as you can, right? The applications for these uh, start, um, uh, the application will probably open in May. It will probably close in late July. The state awards the applications usually in early December. So if you're thinking about applying for next year, this May of 2020, you should be reaching out to your regional economic development council representatives like now as well as putting together some of the core concepts of whatever project it is you might be um, thinking of applying for. This is just an example of one of the uh, metrics, if you will, for rating the CFA. Um, and so the state awards 80 points and the Regional Economic Development Council uh, awards 20. And that's the same across all of the funding programs. I just showed you an example from just one. This is from last year, uh, or excuse me, 2018. The 2019 awards would be, should be funded uh, or announced or, or in about a month and a half. Um, so uh, the guidebook is actually pretty cool. And I'll, I'll try to show it to you on the website when we're done here with this PowerPoint. Um, and because it lists all of the available resources and it gives brief descriptions of them, brief instructions, and brief uh, kind of application uh, uh, advice. So I believe this is the last slide. And so at this point, I think I can, I'll, I'll hold on here for a minute. 
This is my contact information. <clears throat> so at this point, I want to transition to the website. But I also want you to take a minute to jot down my phone number and my email address because we can help you with that, with thinking through uh, what kinds of projects uh, might your community need, what kind of funding is available for it, and where do you go? Next step. So, um, so there's my contact information. That's part of our mission is to help you guys help you, the communities that you serve uh, through primarily through water and wastewater infrastructure, but through other projects and, and planning processes at the municipal level as well. So um, as we transition to the website, I'll just remind you again, we have that questions um, tab on your control panel. Uh, so if you have any questions, please um, jot them down there and we will get uh, to them uh, in just a few minutes. I wanted to take a couple of minutes to uh, walk through this website. So again, this is regionalcouncils.ny.gov. Uh, this is where the consolidated funding application uh, lives, and so you can see it here. Um, I want to start kind of from the beginning uh, for a minute. Uh, first of all, I, I wonder if anybody knows, I, I know the answer, but if anybody knows what town this is on this website. If you do, put it in the questions. Curious. Um, and somebody reminds me at the end to say who if no one guesses right. <coughs> um, all right, so I want to start at the beginning and go to the regions here. I'm just going to pick uh, central, central New York because uh, it's where I sit. Um, so if you click on your region, it takes you to that region's page. Um, and then you can scroll. You can scroll down and see um, information that they have. Uh, so in this region, we've got a workforce development fund that's open. Uh, that came through uh, the CFA last year. So they're looking at long-term industry needs, improved talent pipelines, et cetera. You can click there to find out more. You know, this is the CFA application here. We'll go back to that later. But what I really wanted to point you to is um, how to find out what your region is interested in. So reading their annual progress report, this tells you what they've been working on, what projects they've funded, uh, where they're going, excuse me, <laughs> um, with some of those projects and with some of their strategies and goals. Um, and then, you know, as you scroll down, you find some other news as well. And then I, I think one of the, and, and all of the regional pages essentially function in the same way as this one. So as you scroll down further, you can see all of their past reports from previous years, their strategic plan report. Uh, if we clicked on the view more, it would take you to their first report they probably ever wrote um, in 2011, 2012, when this CFA program was um, conceptualized. So when I said earlier, how do you talk to your regional economic development councils, you want to know who's on the council first, right? And so clicking on the leadership, as I just did, well, there's the regional director, Jim Fail, and there are the co-chairs, and there are the council members. And the councils are usually, for each community, or for each um, region, pretty long. And so I bet that you probably know somebody on your regional economic development council. They may not be your neighbor, they may not be your friend, but you may know them or may know of them. Um, and even the ex officio <coughs> members is a, somewhat of a long list. You may even be one of these people. And so, <coughs> excuse me, um, reaching out to uh, someone on your council, just like you would reach out to, or, or the regional director, just like you would reach out to a program officer for a funding program, um, is really useful because they may say, hey, look, you know, we're not going to fund your wastewater treatment plant this year, or it's not going to rank very high this year, and here's why. Or if you're going to come forward, come forward with this project idea, you should include this component because it addresses one of our strategic goals and that will help you rank higher. That's the kind of information you want to hear, right? That's the kind of thing you're only going to get if you call one of the people on this list. All right, so I'm going to navigate back to the um, 
the home page for the regional account development councils. Actually, I'm still in the central New York, so I'm going to navigate back one more time. All right, I'm still looking for answers of what town that is. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, yes, it is a picture of Geneva. <laughs> um, all right, uh, so let's go to the CFA uh, for a minute. So um, I'm going to go to the, well, first of all, I want to go to the, the projects. Because like I said earlier, it's really good for you to see what, they're, what they've funded in the past. And some of these projects are years in the making, right? <clears throat> so they may have funded something in 2014, and <clears throat> that project is still being built or developed or whatever. You can sort, if you look to the left, you can sort these by region. So yeah, I'm not really interested in what they're doing in the North Country or New York City because I sit in Central New York. I'm more interested in um, what my neighbors are doing so I know whether or not I should be doing the same thing or not. So. Sorry, one minute. So if we click on Central New York, scroll down, click on Filter Projects, um, then it shows everything that's, that's been awarded uh, in Central New York. And now this I'm more interested in, right? This is my region. I'm interested in what people are funding here and, um, and, and what they're doing, right? It's a pretty long list. There's more than nine pages of these. So you can also filter by agency. So I'm really interested in the DEC's WQIP program, so I'm going to select them. But the ESC funds a lot of DEC, DEC projects, so I'm also going to uh, select them. And then scroll down. So I've got my region uh, and the two uh, uh, funding programs I'm most interested in. All right, now I'm seeing what they're funding that's related to the work that I also want to propose. So you can scroll through and see what's been funded, where, uh, to do what, and you can click on any one of these projects and it'll give you more detail. So wastewater treatment plant improvement project. Again, what a boring name. It doesn't say anything about what they're intending on doing. Um, and then the detail, the village of Hamilton will modify existing aeration tanks, blah, blah, blah. Okay, all right, so that's what they're intending on doing. And they got awarded for it through WQIP, and they got a million dollars. You know, this is the level of detail you want when you're looking at what other people, what other people in your area are doing. So I'm going to navigate back a couple times again. So uh, back to the home page. So the CFA, so that was under consolidated funding application. Um, CFA, we looked at the projects. Um, I'd like to look at the CFA application now. So I'm hoping a lot of you folks are starting to, if not already like very well versed in online uh, applications and things. Um, like if you bank online, if you shop online, if you do other stuff online. Um, the CFA is, application is online. <clears throat> so if we click on Apply Now, which I think is great for a couple of reasons, uh, because you can actually um, share this login information with other people on your grant application team. Uh, and so you could uh, work on something this morning, somebody else can log out, somebody else can log in, and work on it this afternoon. You don't have to be sharing documents necessarily, um, paper or electronic otherwise. It's all in one place. <clears throat> Oops. Um, and so this is the home page. So this is new, cloning an application. So last year, you applied for a park in, next to the creek in your town and you weren't funded. But the feedback that you got was, hey, this is a great project, try again next year. Well, you can clone that application, essentially just recreate it for this year uh, without having to rewrite the whole thing. Maybe there's some things you want to tweak, but you don't have to. So we only have a few more minutes left. Um, I'm going to show you a couple more things here. 
So the, remember the guidebook that I mentioned earlier? That's here. I'm going to open that up real quick. Um, it's something like 200 and, and – oh, maybe this is the wrong book I was thinking of. <laughs> um, this book is an overview of the Regional Economic Development Councils. Um, it includes uh, the funding application and some of the initiatives, the regional priorities, uh, and then the awards and competition from the, last, the previous year. I'm going to go back to our other page. This is the one I meant. I'm sorry. The available CFA resources. <clears throat> so if you want to see descriptions on the projects, yeah, this is the right book, 330 pages. I wouldn't recommend printing it. But the cool thing is, is that you can highlight uh, you're interested in what uh, the energy efficiency program is for um, my CERTA. Click on it. It takes you right to that page. And most of the funding program uh, overview pages look like this. It's not too jargony. It's not thick with text. It's kind of easy to understand what it is that they fund and for how much and eligible applicants who they fund uh, and what their eligible uh, categories include and then what some of their requirements are, what their funding priorities are, what ineligible activities are. These are really important things to look at before you get too far down the road. Uh, and this is just one example of, um, of a funding, <clears throat> funding program. So I'm going to uh, go back again to the consolidated funding application page. We've got the program FAQs, frequently asked questions. Um, when, so this is all from 2019. That round has closed. The 2020 round, again, will open in May, and then they'll have a list of workshops where you can go and ask questions and meet people from the state and the Regional Economic Development Council and understand some of their funding priorities. Um, you know, the, the FAQs will be updated as well. And the, even the resources will be updated a little bit based on budgets and changes in program priorities. So <clears throat> the, the next, so the second to last thing I want to show you here uh, before I think we uh, stop and take a few questions before the top of the hour is a CFA application manual. So if you're not so, like, good with the Internet, or you just want to make sure you understand everything um, as you walk through um, the application. This is a step-by-step -step guide on how to submit your application online. So I'm going to skip the overview. The cool thing that I like about this is, is that there's a lot of screenshots in here. <clears throat> so you can visually see where you should be, right? So this is where you're going to start your application process, you're going to register your new application, uh, and then the next step is this, getting your login credential materials. Uh, the next page, again, another screenshot showing you um, your application number, your project name, email address, activating your account. It only takes a few minutes to do this, right? It's like setting up an Amazon account. And then you log in. So you've set up your, you've registered your account, and now you log in. Again, I don't want to repeat myself, but I really like this guide. It's only 30 pages long, and it's got a lot of um, screenshots so that you know um, exactly where you are and where you should be through the application process. So I think that's a, a pretty cool tool um, that, frankly, coming from someone who uses a lot of uh, funding programs, um, in my work, I don't often get that level of um, ease in application instructions. So that's the guidebook that you would open at the same time that you click register, right? Huh, I have so much trouble with this computer, right? And so this is the first screenshot that, um, that we just saw. And I'm not going to go through here right now because I don't want to give away all of my login information to you guys. <laughs> But this is where you email your, enter your email address, your organization name, your project name, and then you know, show that you're not a robot by doing simple math. And then you click register new application, and that's where they give you your login information, your application number, and then you begin. 
The one thing I wanted to mention um, about the CFA is uh, all of these funding programs that I showed in the available resources guide, um, they are, I know I'm spinning furiously through these pages, but you know, all of these funding programs um, are in the CFA. You don't have to think about which project or which funding program your project is eligible for. The CFA will help identify that for you. Which I think is kind of cool. But, you know, your project does have programs, and look at where your project might fit, where it might be eligible, uh, and also looking at opportunities for maybe, as an example, again, uh, the New York Main Street program and the local waterfront revitalization program could potentially co-fund one of your projects because their priorities could be aligned um, in a way that your project uh, helps them. All right, <clears throat> so that's everything I pretty much wanted to share today. Um, I think we've got a few minutes for a few questions. Again, here's my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and thank you, Grant, for identifying it as Geneva, uh, and Ken Hughes, uh, also identifying it as Geneva. So we've got a couple questions, and I think Tess will read them. Yeah. Um, so the first question is really simple. It's just asking us to remind everyone what the date of the last webinar was. So that was September 18th. And the website you can go to get that is www.esbnetwork.org. And you would just go to the past events tab. We will actually send that link to you in a follow-up email. If you registered for this webinar, you will get an email that has a link to the recordings for both today's webinar and the last webinar. So all that information will come your way. You'll be able to click directly and even forward it to other people if you want to. Um, so getting right into the questions, um, this question is sort of specific to ESC grants. Uh, so Chris, do ESC engineering planning grants apply to source protection or remediation projects, or would that just apply to a wastewater project? No, it, it'll apply. So the ESC engineering planning grants apply to pretty much any physical infrastructure related to water and wastewater. So, uh, so source water protection, um, looking at uh, potential filtration or potential other physical infrastructure remediation. Uh, yeah, you could uh, get the EFC engineering planning grant for for that. Yeah, and on, in line with this question, you had talked a lot about co-benefits to start off with. Um, when there's, you know, when you're looking at co-benefits, what are some good ways to identify what those could be? If you're just thinking about what you need, how might you start thinking about what other ways your project could help? Do you have any advice for going about that process? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> I wish. I spent a little more time on the table of contents page for the available resources uh, guidebook because there's a lot of different programs. Um, and just because I've been focused on infrastructure doesn't mean that Empire State Development isn't interested in funding wastewater or drinking water infrastructure because they are. Because if you're looking at economic development, you need solid infrastructure to build upon. And as many of you may know in your own communities, people don't want to build businesses or homes where there might not be a water line or wastewater. So um, there's a lot of opportunity for co-benefits thinking outside of the box a little bit. Um, and that's one example. The other example I might give has to do with stormwater. Uh, so I gave an example earlier of building sidewalks out of porous pavement that make the community more walkable. Um, but also manage stormwater in a different way that, that improves water quality uh, and decreases, um, uh, it also increases uh, sanitary sewer capacity. Those are three benefits in one project that could be uh, funded or attracted or attractive to three different funding programs. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably a good example, couple of good examples. So we are hitting the top of the hour, but I think it would be great to get to just one more question. So to finish it up for the day, um, you know, we talked a lot about these grants. Some of these grants are multi-million dollar projects. Um, 
say you're a very small community and you know you'd love to have a grant, but you're just not confident about your capacity to administer that amount of money. Do you know if there's what other options might be available to you if you just know that administering a large grant isn't for you? Uh, there's a, a number of consulting firms out there who are happy to help you write an application uh, with the kind of expectation that they'd have an opportunity if upon award to uh, to uh, be the program manager for that application. Uh, so um, not only can some of these engineering consulting firms do some of the feasibility studies, some of the costing and analysis, <clears throat> uh, engineering preliminary designs, they can also do the project management um, and they can do the procurement of some of the contracting and stuff like that too. Um, and so, uh, Again, a lot of these consult a lot of consulting firms are happy to help you develop an application um, if they're able to um, be uh, considered uh, as a project manager if, if the project's awarded. And so, you know, you're going to obviously have to pay for some of their for, for their time to do that. But a lot of these funding programs are broken up into different categories of where the funding goes. So there's like you know, money for construction, and what does that look like? And then there's an administrative force, and the administrative force line is essentially the time it takes to administer the, the grant, the project. And a lot of that money would then end up being allocated toward a consultant who could um, administer the project on your behalf. Awesome. Well, we are right at the top of the hour, so I think we need to end it for today. Um, like I mentioned, we will send you a follow-up email with links to the recording for both this webinar and the last webinar we did. And if you do have any other questions that maybe we didn't have quite enough time to get to, um, go ahead and send them to us now. Chris's information is up there. You can also reply to any of the emails you received from GoToWebinar or reply to any of the follow-up emails you might get from us. So, Chris, do you have any closing comments? Uh, no, just thank you for um, thank you for joining us today. Please reach out with any other questions or if you have any help. And and thank you to Faith and and Representative from Dissy's office for helping us put this webinar together.